<laughs> Los Angeles is dealing with a spike in brazen and sometimes deadly robberies. From high-end stores in Hollywood to mansions there, thieves have been stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, electronics, and much more. L.A. police say robberies are up about 12, per, excuse me, 17 percent this year compared to the same time last year. Just yesterday, cops in L.A. released this video, surveillance video. Two guys in masks robbing two men at gunpoint as they waited for the elevator there in downtown Los Angeles. They say the suspect stole jewelry, a phone, and the victim's car. Police later found that car with the phone inside, but they're still searching for the two suspects. CNBC's Seema Modi is in Beverly Hills, where people who can afford it say they're paying big bucks for better security. With crime on the rise in Los Angeles, the rich and famous are increasingly opting for houses in gated communities like this one in Beverly Hills. Past the entrance is this $29 million estate with another gate, 30 security cameras, and a separate IT room used for around-the-clock surveillance. A lot of these newer constructions, you know, if you're looking at a, a very expensive home, it's probably going to have a safe room. That's top-selling real estate agent Jason Oppenheim. You may recognize him from reality show Selling Sunset on Netflix. He says the crime situation is so bad, more high net worth clients are leaving town. Honestly, more clients leave California in the last 18 months than I think left in the last 10 years combined before that. In a city that likes to flaunt its wealth, many residents of Beverly Hills told us they are keeping their jewelry at home. I never wear jewelry. I mean, that's just not safe. And seeking personal protection. This street right here, right outside, w w myself and many of my neighbors are looking to contribute a monthly fee to have a security guard here at night. Knife, 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 knife! Not just any security. We're talking highly sophisticated professional guards trained by former Israeli military officers. A lot of executives now uh, reaching out. One hour outside Los Angeles at Pacific West Academy. These guards are learning how to be nimble, act fast, and react to gun violence. Using their presence first, verbal commands, physical touch if necessary, and then lethal force as a last means. And that is really only when presented with uh, imminent threat to life. Don says highly trained guards with law enforcement experience average $1,000 a day or more, which means most Americans can't afford it. They can afford it. Let them get it. <laughs> we need more security guards in Beverly Hills in addition to the celebrities having. You need to get yourself on it. I'm serious. This morning I was watching videos in California where people were literally going to Target grabbing a bunch of stuff and brazenly walking out the store as California leads the rest of the nation follows. This is right now. Criminals are losing their mind. Now, during the recession and during the global reset, crime is going to dramatically spike up. So, one of the things you want to do is get yourself a gun and not only get yourself a gun go to the range and learn how to use your gun i hope that you never have to shoot anyone but uh, at one point in the car rental business i felt unsafe and i started carrying the gun and i remember i was having a contra contra confrontation with someone who owed me like three days rent and the GPS uh, kill switch didn't work on the car and he brought it back and he wanted to get rowdy. And I was just felt comfortable knowing that if he escalated, I could protect myself. And you know, he calmed down and he left and we never got to that point, but just having that option for these clowns, because here's the thing, Google, go to YouTube and look at wave, crime waves in California. Because what's happening in California is going to filter out to the rest of the country as the um, recession and global reset roll. Because once the recession hits, once these layoffs hit, you're going to see people who are going to become criminals of opportunity. Now, what do I mean by that? Folks who have never stolen anything, who've never done any crime, they're going to be forced to do these things. And one of the things 
that I am seeing here in Atlanta, Atlanta is the seventh highest crime center in the United States. California, Los Angeles being number one, San Francisco being number two, I think Dallas. And what you're seeing is these big wealthy cities are because here, here's the thing. You have worthless and demo people. Let's go ahead and talk about the homeless people. The homeless people as a whole do not commit crimes. They're homeless. They don't have a place to stay. However, there is a segment of the homeless people that do create, do commit crimes and do crazy stuff. Uh, you're just going to see this behavior explode. And one of the reasons that I moved, and I don't know if I shared this with you, is my house was indefensible. For the most part, that didn't really happen in Sandy Springs, but I knew that the global reset, the recession and all this stuff was coming in my house. Like, let me give you the setup. There was the front door and there was glass from, from the living room to the dining rooms, you know, floor to ceiling windows. And then to the side, there was a big window and there was a door with glass. So, and this is one thing, the house was so big, someone could be in there and I wouldn't even know it. They could be downstairs and I wouldn't even know it. And I just started to feel a little uneasy because I knew it was coming. While I was living there, I didn't have a care for the world. Nothing ever happened. But going forward, it's going to get bad. I don't know if that house will be impacted, but I moved just for a prophylactic measure. And if, if I get another house, it's going to have a gate. It's going to have a gate. I am not going to be in a situation because I remember one morning and I had a ring uh, doorbell. If you don't have a ring doorbell, you should get one. Some lady was walking around my yard and I was like, who? And I go, and I was like, who are you? Oh, she was like, I was just admiring the flyers. I was like, cause see, I was taught growing up not to walk across people's yards because it was personal property. You respected people's personal property. And I was like, who is this chick? It was some little white woman just walking around my yard. It was crazy. And um, the, the crime is just going to be stupid. And there is word that we're going to have a food shortage in a few months. That is going to bring out a lot of crime diesel shortage, uh, which is starting now is bringing out a lot of crime. So what you're going to see is a bunch of people who were normally not criminals start to participate in the criminal economy. Now the criminal economy has been around. The primary economy is you go in the Best Buy or you go in the Macy's or the grocery store. That's the primary economy. The secondary economy is the sale of used goods on Craigslist, OfferUp, Facebook Marketplace. The third economy is the crime, the criminal economy. And what is happening is there are people who are going into Target who are literally getting a handful of whatever they want and straight up walking out. And these people are called boosters. The boosters acquire the merchandise and then they send the merchandise to a fencer who sells the merchandise and removes all of the tags and identifying marks of the store. So from a standpoint, Walmart, Target, uh, I'm going to explain something that happened to me recently and I feel it was a criminal act. Uh, Apple, because once again, I have a little product project that I'm doing. I'm selling stuff on eBay, you know, using new Apple products. And um, I ordered some Apple products and I got a message that they were delivered. It was a 13 inch MacBook Pro. It was um, iPhone Pro. It was um, some other stuff. And I got this message, it was delivered, but I never got my goods. And what I didn't know until I called and told them I never got it was that Apple uses Uber drivers. So an Uber driver got him a MacBook Pro, an iPhone and some other stuff that he could easily sell. Uh, I spent, 3,400 bucks for this stuff. He can easily sell that for $1,500, $2,000 real quick, real fast. So 
because I, I, I'm, I'm just sitting there like, you know, and they called Uber and Uber's like, yeah, the guy delivered it. And then uh, they're supposed to take a picture when they deliver it. Because uh, literally I bought stuff from Apple before and the person who dropped it off took a picture of me holding the product um, and there was no picture. So Apple replaced the items. But what you're going to see are billions and billions and billions dollars of losses because crime, like I said, crime is stupid now, okay? It is stupid now. The murder rate is stupid now. As the economy continues to melt down, it's going to spike up. Murder, and this is a stat that is very grim, suicide rates are at all time high. People are taking their own lives because of the stress and the pressure, and that's going to, Murder is going through the roof. Domestic violence is going through the roof. Petty crimes are going through the roof because I feel that America has changed. It used to be poor people had pride. And this is something else I'm starting to see quite frequently. You will see somebody, they will park themselves near a popular uh, tra a place with high traffic and they'll hold up a sign, I need help. I am starting to see that like, coming here, they consistently do it there. And I saw eight people in Sandy Springs doing that. I lived in Sandy Springs 13 years. I have never seen up until recently, I have not even seen one person begging. In the last few weeks, I have saw eight people with their little, little signs. There's one guy, he had a dog with him. And I remember there was a woman who was Muslim because she had the Muslim headrest on and she was having a sign and she had her kids out there. So you've got people who are resorting to begging and that's the first step before criminal activity. Because I'm about to say something that may seem a little dismissive, but I have more respect for a criminal than someone begging for money. I know that's a little twisted, but a criminal actually is doing something to get their money. Even though it's illegal, in some cases it may be very illegal, but I just could not see myself, and I was in a situation where I was dead broke. I just could not see myself on the side of the road holding up a little sign. I just couldn't see it. And to the people who have gotten to that level, I don't know what happens from a mental standpoint for you to get to that level, but for the kid, I ain't doing that. I mean, I've had some hard times. I was homeless, I was sleeping in my car. I was living in a boarding house. I had weeks where I didn't have money for food. I was walking around with my stomach growling because I was hungry. And I didn't resort to begging and I didn't resort to crime. And <clears throat> I will tell you, and I will share this story with you. I did some white collar crime one time two times and because I was desperate and I know what a desperate mind will focus on. Um, and actually this is one of the things and uh, it kind of scared me because it was so easy and I got myself $50,000 in a week. Now I'll tell you what I did. And it's very hard to do this today. I went ahead and I had checks because I posted a video of my podcasting equipment. It's almost like, get rid of the checkbook. You can't see the numbers. But if, if you write someone a check and they take a picture of their check, they have all of the information they need to create a counterfeit check and run it through your banking system and get money. So uh, my first act of white collar crime, which I, I kept that. Uh, what I did is I went through, I found a high-end neighborhood and I went to the post office. And literally, this is what I did. I went through the trash. I pulled all of the trash out of the post office. I was riding a bus. So I'm on the bus with these three huge trash bags. So I get back to my place and I go through the trash and I hit a jackpot. I found a pre-approved credit card offer to computer warehouse and I filled it out and I got a computer and I had them send the computer to a place that I didn't leave live and I, I got expedited shipping. So I knew exactly what day it was coming. So I, I had to rent a car 
because you know I had a 17 inch monitor, I had an IBM JIT tower, and I had a laser printer and something that I ordered was called magnetic ink. And I had to rent a car because it was huge. There was no way I could carry these computer parts on the bus. So I rented a car and I, the FedEx guy, I was waiting and the FedEx guy pulled up and he dropped it off and then I went ahead and scooped it up and I went back to my room and I started printing up counterfeit checks. And uh, how did I cash the checks? Um, I actually opened up a bank account at a credit union and I never went to the credit union. I did it all through the mail. I opened up the bank account, I got the debit card through the mail, never went into a branch. And what I would do is I would deposit the checks in the depository at night. I would never go in the bank because there's cameras everywhere. And then once the checks cleared, then I would go to an ATM machine. And this is the part where it got um, kind of freaky. I can only get 500 bucks a day. So every day I was going to the ATM and I was going to the ATM like this. So they never had a picture of my face. And I like you asked, how did I get the ATM card? I found a place that had a mailbox. It was a trailer. It was a mailbox. So I used that address for the banking activity and I used that address to get the ATM card. After this stuff hit, because uh, the people that I was stealing the money from, they noticed. And I noticed that I went to the ATM one day and I couldn't get money out because I think I got $22,000 and then the ATM card stopped working and the ATM machine kept the ATM card. And as I was going back, the place that had the mailbox, the mailbox was gone. So a lot of stuff happened, but that was my white collar criminal activity. Now, I will be honest, I kept the computer. Um, that computer was one of the reasons that I got into internet stuff. And then that computer, I kept that computer. Then I got rid of that computer um, when I got the job at Rent-A-Crate. I didn't really need the computer anymore. So I got rid of that computer. Then I got my own computer. And then when I started YouTube, that was all new stuff. But I was desperate. And I'm gonna tell you why I stopped doing it. It was ridiculously easy. It was ridiculously easy. And it scared me because it was so easy. I felt that if I continued to do it, I was gonna get caught. Because like I said, the way that I set it up, I never went to the bank. I did it through the mail. There was no, and I never, I never used the address where I live to get anything. So there was never going to be a knock at the door, someone looking for something, because I used all these mail drops, and um, I knew that if I continue to go through the trash, like of a high, you know, find yourself, a, you know, I found myself a rich neighborhood, and I just went to the mail the post office and pull the trash bags and you will you will be blown away at what people throw away you would literally be blown away at what people throw away and i was able to get a i think at the time it was 4500 bucks for that computer because i got the top of the line the laser printer the magnetic ink and you know one day i was just sitting down and after i did and i was like if you keep this up it's gonna become a habit. And once it becomes a habit, you're going to go to jail at some point. And I just stopped. And I know a lot of y'all think I'm crazy. I returned the money. I returned, I pulled out 22,000 and I returned 21,000. I kept a thousand, I kept the computer, which actually, that's how I had the computer to go on monster.com to get the job at Renacrate. So if it wasn't for that computer, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did with Renacrate, which started my upward trajectory. Since I had that job at Renacrate, every year of my life has consistently got better. And it started off with a stolen computer. 
So, you know, think what you will of me, but I'm just being honest. I'm letting you know the mind of someone who is desperate and what they will do. And like, and to that point of my life, I had never, I had never committed a crime in my life. Never, never thought about it. You know, if I needed money, I would get a job, I would get a second job. Never, never entered my mind. So this is what I'm saying. You're gonna have a lot of people who are gonna become criminals of opportunity. They're gonna do things that they never ever thought they would do. Right now, there's a woman who's on the Sugar Baby website. And tonight, she's gonna be sucking the old man's dick. This woman never in her life ever thought about being a prostitute. But circumstances got to the point, she got bills, she needs money, and she's gonna suck that dick. She gonna do it. So as the global reset and the recession roll on through the economy, you're gonna see a lot of first time offenders. You're gonna see a lot of people who will do things that they never thought they would do, never entered their mind, like me. I wasn't like, and thank God I had the presence of mind and I had a conscience because I felt really, really bad about it. And I'll tell you how I took the money back because at the time you can only get 20s out the ATM. So I had a bundle like this thick. And what I did is I got a box and I put all the cash in the box and I took it back to the place that I got the checks. And I wrote, I'm sorry. And I left it on someone's desk. I left it on the desk. And um, I really didn't feel good about it. And one of the things is I, I can see how someone can get caught up in the life of crime because it was ridiculously easy. It was so easy easy and you know it's like crime doesn't pay crime pays crime pays until you get caught and then once you go to jail that's when all the games and fun stuff is over but i'm just real thankful that i had the presence of mind to not keep doing it because this is what i feel what would have happened if i had kept doing it at some point i would have gotten caught and I would have been outside of normal society. I would have been on that career criminal track and I would have went to jail and I would have spent some time in prison. And then I would have I've been a convicted felon. And at that point, you know, I watched these prison documentaries. I can see how someone can get caught up because for fortunately for me, I was in the military, I had a good job, so I knew what normal, active, regular life was. There are people who never actually had a normal life. There are people, and especially right now with the gig economy, you have people who will never actually have a real job. They'll be doing DoorDash, they'll be doing Uber, they'll be doing Lyft, they'll be doing Rody, they'll be doing Amazon Flex. These folks will never get a real job. How do I know? I be checking out my DoorDash people. Most of them dress like fucking bums. And I'm just sitting there like, you know, they don't have proper presentation. I can't see these people going through a, a, a proper interview. And once you get on that career criminal track, you leave normal society. And once it becomes a habit, you're fucked. You're fucked. You, you just like, I know. There are people up in this building doing criminal shit. I know, and I can almost eyeball them when I see them, and I'm just sitting there like, yeah, you're doing that. Yep, you're doing that. Because the thing is, one of the things is, uh, and this is something you see in Omni and the Hellcats videos, a lot of people just hanging out in the middle of the day. It's 12 o'clock, you have nowhere to go, you're not being productive, you're not working on anything. This is how you can, like, I mean, the hell, he was a criminal. He was a criminal. He sold drugs. And once again, the, I am so glad that I made the decision to stop and to resume living in mainstream life. Because um, if I had continued, there would be no YouTube channel. There would have been no storage auction stuff there. None of this stuff would have happened. I would be a 55 year old man with a criminal record out there doing whatever. 
and this is how I know, and this is why I speak to you guys the way, because I know what can happen. I know what can happen. And a lot of you like, you know, when I give you these income stats and people are like, oh, I don't believe it. You know, average income gotta be 50 grand. No, it ain't. 81% of Americans make $35,000 a year. And this is the thing that creates so much thirst. Back in the day, when you were poor, only people you knew were people in your immediate surroundings. Today, you've got kids six years old going on social media and realizing, oh, we, we broke as shit. I didn't understand. I'm gonna tell you when I had an understanding of how poor I was, because it was just how we lived. We didn't have a house with indoor plumbing. Didn't know any better. And when I went to Bottenfield, that's when it hit me that there were people who were living way better because I could see it. There was a, a place called Holiday Hills in Forestdale, Alabama. And Holiday Hills was an enclave of middle to upper class black people. And I kind of knew the type because my cousins were those type. And I would just see these little black kids with the fresh polos, the leather Nikes, the Levi's, the Jordash. And they would like, I remember this one uh, kid, Walter Collins, Walter Collins. Walter Collins had polo shirts for every fucking day of the week. He like, he would have four or five pair of Nikes. And I was just sitting there, uh, Walter Collins, and there was another little kid, Derek Bracey. Um, his father was an attorney and his father drove a Bentley before Bentley was a thing. I mean, these were well-off, rich, little black kids. Uh, Leslie Horton, I remember this one chick, um, and I actually have a picture of her. She was so nice. This girl was beautiful, beautiful, just beautiful. And I remember once in the military and I was hanging out with one of my friends and her name was Jackie Nation. And we were hanging out with Jackie and I actually have a picture of her. This chick, just compared, she was naturally beautiful, but the thing that was so cool about her was she was extremely nice, very compassionate. And she lived in Holiday Hills. And um, I don't know what Holiday Hills is like today, but that was my first um, encounter with people who were wealthy and black. I, I mean, you know, George Jefferson was kind of like the only thing I had. And then at one point I had this wild ideal that I wasn't being challenged enough at my high school. I was attending minor high school. So I left minor high school, got a job at sign builders, and I enrolled in Holy Family Private School in Inslee, Alabama. I was enrolled in private school in high school and I was paying for it for myself. So I was an odd little kid. And I remember there was these two sisters, ridiculously, let me go ahead and explain to you. First of all, both of the sisters were ridiculously beautiful, okay? And they were small. They were small. They were, they were very feminine. They were very small. And like Jackie, they were extremely nice. They were extremely nice. And what I had to do to get to school is I had to get rides. And I remember uh, the older sister had a Toyota Celica. And they would drop me off up in Forestdale and my mother would pick me up. That's how I went to private school. And it, it was crazy. And from a logistics standpoint, I'm just looking back at how the hell did I even pull all that off? Cause I didn't have a car. And I, I actually hooked a ride with a guy who worked in the steel plant in Inslee. He would drop me off at school and then they would take me home and my mother would, and I'm just looking back at that. And, but once again, these girls were stunningly beautiful and they were like, you know, small, like, the big sister, she had some big titties, little bitty waist, she had, a, she had a booty, she had a little booty. And the other sister who, in my opinion, was actually more beautiful, she looked like a fucking doll. 
and um, she had moderate breasts. And mo I mean, these girls were gorgeous and they lived in Holiday Hills. That's where all of the young, pretty black, black princesses lived and it was crazy. But that was, you know, life in 1985, man. But once again, crime is about to get stupid. It's about to get stupid.